Right, so uh, let me take the opportunity to invite um, everybody, the participants and the faculty for this wonderful webinar that we have organized from the ITRU group. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all over here. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We say this because there are so many people from different parts of the world and hope you are all safe. Today's webinar is focused on um, bladder tumor, irritation and endoscopic resection. I think it's a topic which has a lot of uh, controversies at the same time as a lot of exciting discussions and a lot happening here. So we hope to be covering all these aspects. I would uh, take this chance now to invite uh, my dear friends, Dr. Bhavan and Dr. Lu Shilong, uh, who will be chairing the session. Um, I think uh, Bhavan is a, a fantastic uro-oncological specialist from UK and uh, Lu Shilong is a good friend and from Singapore, he's also the head of the department and also interested in oncology, especially bladder tumor. So without further delay, can I pass on the podium to both of you guys to take us forward, please. Uh, thank you, Vinet, for this uh, very special invitation. Um, my name is Lee Shong from Singapore, uh, and my co-chairman is uh, Bhavan. Um, Bhavan. Uh, Bhavan, you, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Again, we'll have to say good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, my name is Bhavan Rai. I'm a consultant urologist with a specialist interest in oncology at the Freeman Hospital in uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, we're all quite excited about today's program. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'll ask if Dr. Lushong could introduce Jeremy and we'll start the program. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yes, thanks, uh, Dr. Bhavan. So it uh, gives me great pleasure to... Uh, in to introduce the first speaker, uh, Assistant Professor Jeremy Chiu, who is my good friend from Hong Kong. And just recently, we, uh, we, we, had, we did a consensus statement for en bloc resection in bladder tumor, which was published in European Urology. So uh, Jeremy, uh, please do us a pleasure, uh, share with us your insights and your data. Thank you. All right, so uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Indeed, my great pleasure. Um, to talk about this topic, which I think is really, really important. Um, today, we have a great program covering many different types of uh, modalities and performing on blood resection. But before we go into the specific type of on blood resection, I think it's really important to understand the current concepts, um, the overview of on blood resection uh, before we actually learn about the specific types of on blood resection. And um, after the overview, then we can learn from the other experts uh, as well. So as you all know, uh, the conventional way of doing TRPT is by piecemeal resection. In fact, it was introduced 19 years ago. Um, it is a minimum invasive procedure, gold standard in the initial treatment of bladder cancer. But then what we observe is that the cancer control of non-Muslim fit blood cancer is actually far from satisfactory. One year cancer rate ranging from 15 to 61%, which is really, really high. And therefore we have so many different ways to try to improve the, the, the treatment outcome, be it installation of chemo, second of surgery, BCG. And we often need to survey the bladder very frequently after the initial TRBT. But then have we ever thought about for a technically superficial disease, a good resection should be able to obtain a cure. We should be aiming a recurrence rate of 0% at one year. But now it's on average 30 or even some reports 35, 40%. So I think it's really important to understand how the disease recur and the different mechanisms and to understand what on blood resection can really give us uh, in terms of disease control. If we think about the mechanisms, in fact, there are a number of them. The first one is about the detection of cancers because some tumors are very small. Sometimes the cancer change is very subtle and therefore we have some imaging modality which can help us, be it a narrow band imaging, uh, image 1S or photodynamic diagnosis. Um, is this a predominant mechanism of recurrence? Probably not, because um, if you remember the Crohn's um, RCT of white light versus NBI, 
um, trial uh, published at European Urology, basically overall speaking, there's no difference between the two groups. Um, there seems to be some differences in, in patients with low risk cancers, but then in the really bad tumors, intermediate risk or high risk cancers, then there's no difference. So I believe it's not really a major mechanism for it to recur. But then there's a very important mechanism about the local resection. Um, because of the minimum invasive approach, we tend to resect in a peaceful manner in a top-down approach. But then whether a complete resection has been achieved is totally dependent on the surgeon's vision. And because the specimen is often scattered, the pathology is very, um, it's very difficult for the pathologist to tell us whether the tumor has been resected completely by histological assessment. And therefore we may have residual TA or T1 disease, and we, we may even have an understage disease. Is this a major mechanism? Probably one of the major mechanisms, because remember patients with T1 disease, if we routinely do a second look surgery, then the chance of finding residual cancer is 20 to 30% in many reports. And you think about that one year recurrence rate, 30, 35%, then it starts to make some sense, isn't it? And then you think about the other mechanism, which is more theoretical. When we resect a tumor in a peaceful manner, then there will be floating tumor cells in the bladder. The tumor cells might reimplant into the bladder, causing, uh, leading to early disease recurrence. Is there any, any evidence that this is true? In fact, we do have some genetic studies, for example, patients with multiple uh, bladder tumor. If we take biopsy from each tumor and then we do some genetic sequences, then it, it seems that all tumors arise from a single clone which means that tumor seedling probably occurs within the bladder. But of course, whether after you resected it, whether a recurrent tumor represents the original tumor, then we don't have such studies to prove it, but probably it exists. And therefore we have some treatments, for example, uh, an immediate installation of uh, myotomycin C after operation would hope to reduce the, the tumor implantation. And uh, in fact, there are some studies showing that this, is, this practice is actually beneficial. The fifth one is probably something that is most difficult to tackle. It's about the field change effect, especially in patients who have a heavy smoking history, um, uh, patients who have some kind of exposure to, to some chemicals, then there may be field change cancerization. And um, if, Again, it's very difficult to prove that this exists, but we believe it's probably so. How frequent it exists, we don't know. But then we have some ways, for example, if we advise for smoking cessation, it's been proven to reduce recurrence rate, prevent disease progression, and even has some impact on the outcome, uh, the oncological outcomes as well. And of course, we can instill BCG, and it's been proven to reduce both recurrence rate and also progression rate. And last but not least, if a patient has a history of uh, upper tract tumors, and of course the tumors might have what we call a drop metastasis, but again, upper tract tumors are rare. And uh, most of the time we already have some kind of imaging, for example, CT urogram. So probably this is uh, a less likely form of recurrence for patients with bladder cancer. And we think about all these, probably two, three, maybe four and five, these are the real mechanisms that we'd have to deal with if we really want to improve the outcomes of normal severe blood cancer. And on blood resection is really trying to do two things. One, to ensure a complete local resection. And secondly, you hope to minimize the manipulation of tumor, hope to reduce the tumor from seedling into the bladder. And this procedure actually has been proposed many years back then, 1980. But then, you know, it hasn't raised a lot of interest during that day. And then, uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago, that it becomes more and more popular, especially in Europe and now in many parts in Asia as well. Uh, of course, I won't uh, drill into the technical details because I'll leave this part for the other experts in the room. Uh, but basically, if you're uh, able to do it properly, you should be able to achieve something like this. And then, of course, you need to communicate with a pathologist to have a proper assessment. And most of the time, they'll be able to give you a very good slide. You have a good idea about the depth of uh, invasion, as well as whether a complete resection has been achieved in terms of the circumferential margin, as well as the deep margin. In fact, um, the interest has really increased in the past 20 years. Um, um, and uh, I think this is something that is going to be bigger in the future. 
But then we also observe some problems as well because, you know, on blood resection of blood tumor, although it's the most commonly used name, but then there are many different ways of doing it, many different terminology. And the problem is we tend to do on blood resection in our own way, and there's often a lack of standardization. And, um, and, and unfortunately, we don't have huge amount of large scale RCTs for make re uh, making recommendations. And therefore, you know, when there's already practice of ombly resection globally, how can we really standardize the procedure with the best evidence that we have? And therefore, this, uh, therefore with this background, um, we actually have been, have been initiative trying to build a consensus statement, which I believe is something very important as a reference for all people who are practicing ombly resection. In fact, this consensus statement is built on a rather stringent type of uh, uh, developmental process. First, we did a systematic review, and then we designed um, um, a survey, uh, more than 100 statements. We disseminate the survey to uh, 200, more than 200 participants who all have uh, own experience in doing on blood resection. Eventually, we have an expert consensus meeting to discuss on the statement and finally come up with um, some reference for people to, to understand and follow. For the systematic review, actually, it's in collaboration with a number of experts in blood cancer in particular. I really need to thank Stephen McLennan, who is actually working with the AU guidelines office. And we did a systematic review to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of humble resection as well as to identify the clinical questions on, or the, these uncertainties about the procedure. These are really the areas that we need to work on in terms of humble resection. And after extensive search in the literature, we found that actually there are 10 randomized control trials being published. Most of them were relatively small in terms of sample size, about 100 participants for each trial. The largest one is, is almost 300. Uh, unfortunately, most of them did not have a primary outcome of recurrence rate. Most just look into surrogate markers. And in fact, among the 10 RCTs, many of them were just presented in conferences. So, so some of them were just abstracts. We don't really have full papers. So still, the amount of evidence that we have is still, is still rather limited. But if we try to pull all the RCD data together, we found that, first of all, envelope resection takes a longer time to finish the procedure. But in terms of the mean OT time, operative time, it's longer by about nine minutes, uh, which is you know, not clinically very important. Um, we, we realized that after envelope resection, um, the time, the duration of irrigation is actually shorter, favoring envelope resection. And interestingly, when people People always query when we do on blood resection, will we dig too deep into the deep muscle? Will we worry about blood perforation? In fact, what we have from trial data is actually in favor of on blood resection. The rate of perforation is actually lower. And if we think about that, especially for those who practice uh, on blood resection, we do it in a very precise, controlled manner. And um, for some energy with that, there's also no, you know, there's absence of optical jerk. For example, with laser, there's absence of optical jerk. And therefore, it starts to make some sense as well. Actually, ombre resection would reduce the rate of perforation due to the nature of the procedure. In terms of recurrence rate, um, we do have a few studies, but then the sample size is quite small. Uh, we still did not detect any difference between envelope resection and conventional TRBT in terms of the one year, second year, and third year recurrence rate. But our group feel that it's probably far too early to conclude and we need more large scale studies to address this. And um, after knowing what we know from the literature, we start to design the questions or the statements that, that we feel is important. In fact, we initially developed 102 statements. We deliver the disseminated survey to 200 uh, people, and then we add one statement, and then at the end of the consensus panel meeting, 99 out of the 103 statements actually reached consensus, and these 99 statements were considered um, the reference standard in terms of procedure. Um, in fact, for the expert consensus panel, we do have uh, many experts uh, from Europe, from Asia, and uh, our moderator, Li Xiong, uh, Li Xiong is also one of the experts that was invited. And uh, eventually we got it published uh, at European Urology 
just recently, and I really encourage you all to have a read on that. Of course, there are so many statements, I can't really go through them one by one, but basically it goes through the objectives, it goes through the case selection, which are the case that we really need to select. For example, big tumors, is this still feasible? Surgical procedure, how we should do it, should we mark it? Should we um, do it uh, in science or conventionally first? Uh, should we take biopsy after the envelope resection? Uh, different modalities of envelope resection, does it really matter? Uh, how do we report the findings? How do we prepare the specimen for histological assessment? How do we manage them afterwards? What are important outcomes? There are really a lot of things that are important peri surgery, and therefore we published a consensus statement, and we really encourage you all to have a look at that. Of course, there are you know there are a number of trials that are really ongoing. Um, if you look into clinicaltrials.gov, these are trials that you can find. Um, the first one is actually the multi center trial that is being conducted in Hong Kong, which I'll talk about later. Um, we have a primary uh, outcome of one year current rate. If you look into the third one, it's actually by Prof. Uh, Shariat, uh, 476 patients, but then the primary outcome is the circuit mark of the intrusive muscle sampling rate. But these two trials are probably the largest scale trial that we foresee that the results will come out soon. For the trial in Hong Kong, it is multi center trial are really including smaller tumors, three centimeters below, one year current rate as primary outcome and will aim for a total of 350 patients. And I'm glad to let you know that we have almost finished patient recruitment. Hopefully, um, after one year, uh, at the end of 2021, we will be able to present the results in particular on the recurrence rate, which I feel is particularly important for, our, um, for the, uh, the uh, non-Muslim invasive blood cancer. In summary, Envelope resection, safe, technically feasible for normal symphilic bladder cancer. It can reduce postoperative irrigation time and reduce the risk of bladder perforation. Whether envelope resection can reduce your current rate is unknown, but then we foresee there will be some large scale, style, uh, large, large scale trials on envelope resection, and these results are eagerly awaited. Um, to end my talk, I would like to talk about this paragraph, which is actually the last paragraph in the envelope resection consensus statement paper. Uh, while we're waiting for this trial, um, um, I'm the principal investigator of the trial. Honestly, when I start trial, I was very doubtful whether it will work or not. Uh, with more experience, I am more convinced that it works. I think it's promising. But more importantly is you know, whether it can be generalized um, globally, whether people can learn it uh, properly. So education tra and training is very important. Important. And, you know, in terms of trial setting, what we see is, of course, important, but when we generalize it, whether the benefit can really be generalized is another, is another important issue to address. Therefore, with the foundational statement, our group is actually planning for a prospective international registry study on envelope resection, and we plan to launch it in the coming two months, and we'll aim for 2,000 patients uh, globally hopefully with more insights about the generalizability and the practical aspects of the resection. And more importantly, we hope to find answers for some really difficult questions. For example, um, um, in the specimen, clear margin, but absence of muscle, do you need a second surgery? Positive margin, do you need a second surgery? Early T2 disease, early muscle and failure disease, but a complete resection, do you need a second surgery or radio cystectomy? You know, there are many things that can be addressed if we have a large number of patients just undergoing a procedure in a rather standardized manner. And last but not least, if you believe oncological principles exist for good reasons, I hope we can all work together and contribute to the development of the recession of collaborative manner. By this, I would like to end my talk. So thank you very much once again for an invitation. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be very, very happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I think we'll take the questions at the end of all the presentations of the Q&A section, uh, but that was a great presentation. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, my colleague and uh, good friend Rahul Gujadar to give his presentation, which is perhaps, his presentation is a slight deviation from today's topic, which is enucleation, and he's using Tula. Uh, as an ablative technique. Rahul Gujadar is a consultant at the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. He's also one of the leads for non-muscle invasive bladder cancers and the diagnostic uh, pathways for both bladder and prostate cancers. So, uh, Mr. Gujadar, if I can ask you to take over from me. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, thanks for having me. I think before I start, I would like to 
Hey, congratulate Pavan Zishan and uh, Pascal on you know, creating I True and come a long way in a very short time and it's given us the opportunity to collaborate like this. And last but not least, to Vinit for organizing today. So I've been asked to uh, speak about uh, laser ablation um, and I'm going to talk about the various modalities that exist, but more so about my, my own experience with it, uh, especially over the past year when I've moved on to the uh, diode laser. So a bit brief out outline of what I'm going to talk about so with a background about TULA as to why it's relevant today. What, what is the evidence and what the guidelines say about it? What are the different modalities? I will not. Uh, I think I've come up with my video. Uh, can everyone see me? No. No, no we can't see, see your slides. slides. You, can't, you can't see the slides? No, we can't see Let them. Me try I'm sorry about it. Let me try and rectify this. Can't see the slides. It should be up now. Can you see them now? Yeah, we can see the slides now. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay. So, uh, why is it relevant? What, what do the guidelines say? Uh, what is the evidence for it or the lack of it? Um, there are various uh, ablation modalities, but I will focus mainly on the diode ones because there are other eminent speakers who will talk about thulium and uh, holmium. So I'll stick to diode laser. What the future holds and a bit of my own clinical practice. I think it's um, very important to know what has happened historically because that lets, lets us know, you know how we can improve on things. So when, I, when, I, when we do offer laser treatments of any kind to patients, they always feel that this is a very modern and new technique. I think go realize a laser treatment for bladder cancer, or generally in urology, goes back at least 50 years. I think laser treatment in surgery started in 1968, and the first laser ablation in bladder was done in Germany in 1976, where argon was used. There was a great impetus to use laser at that time, but then that, that momentum certainly, certainly faded away because initially they used the ND YAG laser, and the results at the time were slightly poor in terms of the therapeutic effect, longer catheterization periods. Uh, and also at the time, I, I don't think uh, access to equipment was as good as it was now. This over, um, so I think it died out maybe in the late 80s, but in the last two decades, there has been renewed interest in, in uh, the use of lasers, uh, as today's uh, program suggests. That's also because I think we have better equipment, we've got better access to it, uh, we've got more experience in using the laser. And I, so I think one of the important things is this greater uh, communication now between the operating surgeons and the uh, commercial field of those who make these, these lasers as to what is really required from us. So there's more interaction over time with that. Uh, why, why is the laser ablation important? You know, why, why should we be doing it? I think we all agree that uh, non-muscle non invasive data cancer is a significant disease burden. Over the last three decades, life expectancy in general over the world has increased. It is becoming increasingly expensive to provide quality care. People are living longer, they have more comorbidities, a lot of them are anticoagulants. There is now a reluctance for people to have general anesthetic for the known risks, but also to do, you know, a lot of our population is elderly. They have a lot of significant cognitive impairment, which is made worse by general anesthetic. So if you think for the course of a lifetime, somebody with recurrent cancer, the number of GAs they, they potentially could have. And if you can avoid that with these ablations, that would be helpful. But also, I think overall in urology, we have taken a bit more conservative approach in certain things, you know, with high for prostate or RFAs for kidneys. Laser ablation fits in some, somewhere in that category for, for superficial bladder cancers and recurrent ones. Uh, in terms of the guidelines, I, I want to bring back the, uh, the National Institute of uh, Clinical Health and Excellence in the UK, which we have, which came out with the guidelines for ablation last year. One well, of the first thing they said was there was no major safety concern with the use of, of laser in ablation of, of uh, bladder tumors. And they recommend that it could be used in the treatment of low-grade bladder cancer, but you need to have very special arrangements in place before one can use it in any unit. The, the treatment has to be audited. You need to have a special consent process. In the, the person doing it must be experienced and signed off. And uh, it should be a team, a multidisciplinary team decision from the MDT, the oncology MDT, to recommend the treatment. And then obviously the opportunities for patient selection. 
the, the way I mean they've endorsed it but not not quite fully endorsed it the, the way I see it is like it's you being allowed to go on a date with your girlfriend but but your the, the girl's father is sitting next to you at the next table that's the kind of arrangement the nice guidelines have put in for Chula at the moment uh, the EAU guidelines have been very brief uh, this year uh, they've said that it could be used in in uh, that they're not even used the word ablation, uh, ablation they've used that fulguration could be used for small tumors it may be a safe option but they've not given any guidelines or, or you know as to what the tumor size should be what the number should be what kind of laser time should be used for doing it uh, it's been this, so both these guidelines have not really committed uh, formally to it uh, and the reason being that the evidence we have in the literature is very low in terms of quality and quantity. There are no randomized control trials, which people regard as the uh, gold standard. But again, we can have a debate as to whether randomized control trials are the real way of, of looking at things in, in, in surgical trials. I'm sure Bhavan would have a lot to say because it's a hobby horse of his on this matter. I will not divert, uh, digress on that. And also in the literature, most papers are, are, are based on holmium lasers. But again, people have used different settings for it and different techniques for using it. Some have used blue light uh, with, with the uh, laser ablation technique. Uh, I will not get into the debate of, the, uh, of whether we should use blue light or not, because that's a discussion of its own. There are fewer papers on, on diode and, and thulium. Also, there's a lot of selection bias in the, in, in the cases that are dealt with by this, because most have multiple comorbidities on and ASA3s and ASA4s. And all the papers we have, the full up time is very limited to one to two years. But I think there's one common theme that all these you know, papers show, that ablation of bladder tumors, whichever one is used, it's a very safe, it's well tolerated, and patients report a very good experience and are keen to repeat it. You know, most people have written 90% satisfaction from the patients doing it, so I think which is a very valid point. The recurrence rates, so obviously these are not big, trial, big, big numbers, are between 10 and 20 percent, which is comparable to the 24 percent that one would put if you use the URTC tables. In terms of the major risks, bleeding, infection, or the main ones, a bit of dysuria, there has been only a single case reported in the literature which suggests of, of a bowel injury. But then again, this was using the ND Yaglis, which has the high, highest penetration, which is not commonly used now as a result of that. Uh, this brings me to my next slide. I, I always like putting this because this is the, the diode laser which I use, which is just like a mobile phone. So you can see the advantage of using this. You can move it from one place to the other. Uh, and I'll be in to compare the size. And I've never really put somebody's hand there. So you can just compare, you know, how, how easy it is to use the diode laser compared to the Holmium in terms of logistics. I know I used the Holmium 10 years ago. And the room where I used to flex, it was so small. I had to, you, because having, having to get the laser in, I had to move to a bigger room and that you know, delayed things significantly. So a bit about the technique with the diode laser. So you've got two wavelengths, the 1470 and the 1980. The 1470 is mainly for ablation and the 1980 is mainly for cutting. So for the ablation, I would use four watts. Um, or if you want to use a bit more, if you want to have more of a hemostatic, uh, approach, then you use a blend of the 1470 and the 980 of 4 watts and 2 watts. I use the 400 micron fiber, but the, the laser can have 200 and 600 micron fibers. So it's a normal flexi. The patient comes in as a day case procedure. You have a biopsy and you laser laser the tumor there. It's however done on a dedicated uh, flexible cystoscopist. We require a trained staff. Uh, I've said arrangements for mitomycin C. Normally, this is used for recurrent tumors in, in patients who have got multiple comorbidities. But you know, during COVID-19, uh, with proper consent, I've, I've used this on, on primary tumors on patients who are extremely high risk for a GA. We found some tumors in them, and they were not, you know, they would have they would have to be managed conservatively. Otherwise, they opted for this, and it has worked well. But obviously, I haven't got long-term data on the recurrence rate. Beam and flexes have shown no recurrence. In terms of size cutoff, uh, we have to. I mean, you know, the the, the uh, some of the guidelines in the AUC up to one centimeter or the nice guidelines say that as well but you could go up to two or three and depending on what what the patient uh what is if they are ASA4s who can't have a GA then it depends how, how you want to treat it I know some of my colleagues um, uh, in London have treated five centimeter tumors in, in two settings because the patient was was not fit for a GA and was bleeding and that was the best way for him so I think you have to use it um on a case-based approach 
Uh, what are the advantages of the diode laser? I mean, the main one is the depth of penetration. It's one millimeters compared to holmium, which is about 0.2. You've got a decreased risk of perforation. As I alluded earlier, there's a, uh, we have the option of hemostasis, ablation, and cutting in the same, uh, same laser and setting, which is quite nice. It's very portable. It's like your mobile phone. So, you know, people who are moving from one hospital to the other or from moving from one theater room to the other, we can just move it. I think it's a big advantage. I mean, holmium lasers are very good. They do what they do uh, very well. But, you know, in, in one of my our theaters is down the corridor. Just moving the laser for a full lab operation takes a long time. So do add up to your operating day. I mean, I mean the, the, the Leonardo uh, laser that I do use is probably one twentieth of the holmium laser my trust has bought. So it's lower set of costs. And the other thing I've noticed, if you compare it to the holmium ablation, we don't have to change the settings for sensitive areas like the triangle and the blood and neck or urinary orifices. The same laser could be used for treating strictures, blood and neck incisions, and upper tract ECC, but this is obviously not under local but under general anesthetic. Uh, so in summary, I think laser ablation is a useful arsenal to have in the treatment of low weight TCC, we've got once, especially in patients with comorbidities, it avoids VA. You don't need to stop anticoagulants. You don't need to switch off your pacemaker and defibrillators. This is all good for the patient, but for a unit or a department, it frees up theater capacity because otherwise all these patients would have required a G or spinal. Uh, um, it's a positive experience for the patient overall. Uh, and cost savings, I think, in the era of post-COVID-19, cost of healthcare is going to be a significant issue. And all, all you know, urological units of the world over would have to look at, you know, ways of, of trying uh, to give the best care and, and the uh, efficient costs. In terms of the future, where this, these are obviously the main, um, we, need long, we, we need further research in terms of the uh, uh, further data in terms of the follow-up of these patients. Uh, obviously, we need to have a better cohort of patients. We only have ASC threes or fours, whether we can use, uh, use them in low-grade uh, cases where patients are quite fit and who otherwise would have we normally do a GA. So I think there are um, plans to have some trials in the UK regarding this as to when the results will come out. I think we'll have to wait four or five years. I think this is also uh, an opportunity to collaborate by our group with uh, a lot of other centers to get the data. Um, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Dr. Rahul. Uh, thank you for sharing these insights with us. I think in the post-COVID era where we're trying to streamline care and minimize touch points, uh, this is very yeah. interesting concept for all of us to uh, think about uh, as urologists. So thank you very much. Uh, now it gives me a great pleasure to bring on the next speaker, uh, Associate Professor Zishan Hamid, uh, who is with Kastaba Medical College in Manipal, India. And he's going to talk to us with, about an innovative technique of, well, actually cutting the tumour out with a pair of uh, Z-scissors. So, uh, Dr. Zishan, all the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu. I hope my screen is seen and I'm audible. Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. A very good evening. Greetings from India. I'm grateful to Dr. Bhavan, Dr. Baskar and Dr. Vinit for giving me this opportunity. I'm... Dr. Zishan Hamid from India, and I'll be speaking on Z scissors, which is a novel procedure for treatment of non muscle invasive bladder cancer. Traditionally, TRBT has been the gold standard procedure for resection of bladder tumors, which is done by piecemeal removal of tumor. And this procedure demands resection of bi or biopsy of the tetrasar muscle, which needs to be identified and sent separately for histopathological examination. Off late on block resection has gained popularity. The advantage is being almost 100% presence of the tetrasar muscle. It avoids tumor cell scattering and less chances of tumor reimplantation. And also in the guidelines, it, it uh, EAU guidelines, it says for exophytic part of the tumor, you should perform on block and have little use of cautery for the procedure. This procedure, when we are done using electrocautery, has its own disadvantages. So it can have thermal injury to the tissues, which may lead to artifacts and fragmentation, and may, you may have to resect the tumor again. When you're doing the procedure for lateral wall tumors on block resection using electrocautery, there is a chance of obstructive jerk and perforation, which can be catastrophic. 
and at times when the tumor is present in unfavorable areas like dome anterior posterior wall it may be difficult to do a on block resection on block resection with existing instruments so this brings us to a question do we need a new procedure which has no charring of tissues which has no obturator nerve reflux or nerve jerk and almost near total presence of detrusor muscle and can reach all the surfaces of bladder and also should be affordable hence we came across hold on block excision we invented this z scissors which is a slender long modified endo scissors which is patented under indian intellectual property and also global patent has been uh, applied for this is the pictorial depiction of the procedure where we uh, make sure that two important factors which we look at one is to have adequate deep detrusor muscle and margin and also make sure that there is little use of cautery cautery is used only when there is there are bleeders present on the bladder surface I'll be showing you a video in order to have a, a proper bandwidth. I'll be reducing. I'll be minimizing my uh, video. So the instruments which are used for cold on block excision of bladder tumor includes a twenty point eight French nephroscope, the novel Z scissors, and the electrocautery. We have designed two types of scissors, which are semi rigid as well as a rigid one. The blades of the scissors are different. we have a straight and also we have a curved one this helps us in excising the tumor in different locations inside the bladder both the scissors uh, can be inserted through a 3.5 mm working channel of a 20.8 french uh, mini nephroscope the scissors are slender diameter of less than 3 french length of almost 42 cm and be connected to the electrocautery We use monopolar electrocautery and connect the scissors with high frequency cable. Since it is, uh, it can be sterilized and reused. There is little investment required. The scissors also needs the, I mean, obviates the use of resectoscope for small bladder tumors. It can be managed with the existing twenty point eight or twenty two inch nephroscope. We have deliberately made the scissors little longer so that it can reach any surface of the bladder. after performing a thorough cysto urethroscopy under spinal anesthesia the tumor is located the site size number and the tumor characteristics are noted using the 20.8 french nephroscope and the z scissors the mucosa and the submucosa is cut around the tumor with adequate margins and the deep muscle layer is reached once a plane is created the tumor with the deep muscle is excised on block with adequate margin this small tumor was excised here using the z scissors and with the sparing use of electrocautery as i mentioned earlier electrocautery can be connected and used only when there is some bleeders by avoiding electrocautery we can get a clear tissue without charring of the specimen and there is no residual injury to the bladder and the cautery was used only after the excision of the specimen to coagulate small bleeders on the bladder surface we included tumors less than 3 cm less than 3 in number and pedunculated tumors the exclusion criteria was upper tract tcc tumor at the orifice and endoscopic presence of carcinoma in situ the benefit of using a mini nephroscope here is to maintain uh, continuous irrigation and drainage as this nephroscope has an outer sheath since the caliber of the nephroscope is smaller it can be used uh, instead of a conventional resectoscope and it causes less damage to the urethra and in cases of narrow urethra in this particular case there were three tumors present in the bladder this was the largest tumor which we have excised it's almost 3 cm using the electrocautery the desired margin on the bladder surface can be marked this can give a clear landmark for excising the margin of tumor when you compare this with the conventional trbt in trbt we tend to blindly go beyond the tumor and scope the tumor by using a resectoscope by doing this at times you may uh, injure the collateral uh, so you may have some collateral damage to the posterior wall and sometimes the depth uh, depth perception may be lost and it can lead to perforation but in on block excision after the mucosa and submucosa is cut 
we uh, by using the sharp tip of the scissors we uh, by making multiple small cuts we go into the detrusor muscle plane and once it is identified using the blades of the scissors we create plane and uh, plane is maintained throughout the procedure the detrusor muscle here is identified by distinct white fibers which are interlaced the tumor in this case was uh, too large so we had to use a, a stone forceps to extract the tumor otherwise we use the traditional tumi syringe to take out the small tumors we have kept one aspect in mind during this whole procedure which is minimal use of electrocautery hence the name of the procedure is cold on block excision cautery is used only on the bladder surface as i mentioned earlier after excision to coagulate the bladder surface here we can clearly see the bladder surface after excision of the tumor and we make sure that there is no residual bleeding and there is complete hemostasis again this tumor was little bigger so we had to use a, a stone forceps to extract the tumor through the urethra another major advantage of uh, this procedure is when you have tumor on the lateral walls we deliberately avoid giving obturator block to check the efficacy of jet scissors the disadvantage of trbt or on block using electrocautery is possibility of obturator jerk which can be catastrophic which can lead to perforation this procedure is advantageous for lateral wall tumors as there is no obturator jerk this scissors uh, can gain access to even difficult sites in the bladder here the tumor was present at the dome which is difficult to resect with the conventional instrument here by just rotating the blades we could easily excise the tumor at the dome without any intraperitoneal perforation or collateral damage to the bladder this procedure also has a short learning curve and it is similar to the use of laparoscopic scissors as it is similar to the uh, it's a, it's a modified you know laparoscopic endo scissor we practice shortcuts using the scissors here similar to laparoscopy once the deep muscle is reached the edge can be used to create plane and using the tip of the blades precise cutting of the margin is done and the specimen is removed carefully in toto with the deep muscle avoiding injury or any perforation the white part of the specimen here is the deep muscle which can be marked and sent for histopathological examination the histopathological examination the histopathological examination showed presence of deep muscle and also since it is a single specimen we can come to know the depth of the tumor here you can see the depth of the tumor when compared to the detrusor muscle the, uh, our work was recently published in video endourology and uh, the paper on the pilot study is still under review should be soon published by another journal so the initial results of 12 patients had uh, no obturator reflex there was no perforation and we uh, the detrusor was, muscle was present in almost 92% of the specimens and on follow up of 3 months there were no recurrence to conclude on block resection using z scissors is safe and efficacious there is confirmed presence of detrusor muscle since there is no use of electrocautery there is no obturator jerk no thermal injury to the specimen and also it can be an economical alternative for small bladder tumors another other opportunities for this scissors is surgical treatment of urethroceal we have done couple of cases with adult urethroceal and also removal of body blood body inside the bladder and surgical treatment of impacted stones at times it may be difficult to remove the stones when your anesthetist is happy that he does not he may not require to give a obturator jerk obturator blocks sorry and the scrub nurse is happy because she doesn't need to separate the specimen or look for any deep muscle pathologist is quite happy because it's a single specimen there is almost 100% presence of muscle and there is no charring or artifacts patient is happy because there is less cost less cost no repeat procedure and less complications naturally the urologist also is going to be happy so thank you for the opportunity again Thank you, Zishan. That was an excellent talk, and I think uh, one can see a number of opportunities with the technology that uh, you've developed with the Z scissors. Uh, I'll now request our next speaker.
Dr. Carlun Lu, Assistant Professor at the Chinese University in Hong Kong, and he will be speaking on loop dynamics and bladder tumor endoscopic submucosal di dissection. Dr. Lu, if I could ask you to take the floor, please. Dr. Lu. Thank you. Good evening, everyone from Hong Kong. So thanks, uh, moderator, organizing committee for your kind support and also invitation. So today my topic is uh, BTSD and loop dynamics. So everyone know that uh, bladder cancer is very common cancer. It's a uh, top 10 most common cancer in the world. And it's mostly found in uh, developed countries. And all of us know that this small of us is uh, just only the non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Just only 30% of those have muscle invasive bladder cancer. It means that most of the case can be treated by endoscopic means. Traditionally, we have a TRLBT because uh, it can help us to have kind of therapeutic effect. At the same time, we have kind of staging and also have a pathological outcome to see whether there's uh, any recurrence later on. However, why do we need to have a new method to replace the conventional TRLPT? So I have uh, previous speakers I already mentioned that the drawbacks of a conventional TRLPT is that there's a breaching of the unity of the blood cancer there will be the risk of uh, bladder seeding during the TRLPT. At the same time, there will be close to the obturator nerve, there will be risk of obturator jerk and also perforation of blood cancer. Uh, the most important issue is that sometimes there will be cauterization effect, showing that uh, the pathologists do not have any muscle for proper staging of the lesion. The most uh, recent uh, meta-analysis showing that there's uh, 19 studies with around uh, 1,300 and cases on each arm and compare with uh, between the onboard resection and also TRLPT and found that the onboard resection have a significant lower capital time, hospital stay, intraoperative complication, post-op complication, and also 24 month recurrence rate. Other than that, there are no significant difference between these two groups. So why do we need to have uh, BTSD as a one of the options of the upper resection? Before they have a real case demonstration, there's an animation to show how it works. Firstly, there is a hybrid knife. There's a very strong water jet in the, in the middle of the lumen of this uh, hybrid knife. At the same time, there's also a diaphermy for the cutting and also hemostasis. There's an I-type and also T-type diaphermy. We use a monopolar diaphermy effect. At the same time, we start with similar to on proper section. There's a five to 10 millimeter clear margin from the tumor. After that, uh, you can cut open all the mucosa. The beauty of this uh, BTSD is that, that we can have, uh, inject the mucin blue and also the saline to elevate the tumor before cutting so that it can add a cushion between the tumor and also better wall. So it to minimize the chance of better perforation and also obturator jerk. One of the largest series of BTSD is uh, around 200 cases with uh, 100 cases on each arm of BTSD and also TRPD group. We found that uh, less than three centimeters per tumor, similar operation time. However, the BTSD have a significant shorter post-op better irrigation time shorter capital time and also hospital stay. And also there's a decreased overall incidence of the complication, including the obturator jerk and also blood perforation. At the same time, it has better recurrence-free survival. So nowadays, uh, apart from the CT scan, before the onboard resection, we also can consider the MRI, which is a virus. Virus is developed by a group of experts that developed the MRI funding from virus one to five from long suspicion of muscle invasion to very five, which is uh, invasion of muscle and also to the surrounding organs of the fury bladder. One of the uh, meta-analysis uh, concluded that there are six studies with around 1,000 cases and found the sensitivity of the virus up to 0 0.9 and specificity is uh, 0 0.86. It concluded that this is a very good predictive ability to have kind of uh, predict the muscle invasiveness before the operation. At the same time, it can also help to predict the need of the early second look TRLPT in the high-risk non-muscle invasive blood cancer. 
to illustrate the BDSD, I will have a 70 years old gentleman, Expoca, good past health, present with cross and maturia. And cystotomy showed there's a big tumor, four centimeter over the left postrolectal wall, and also small tumor, one centimeter over the right lateral wall. Before that, also have the MRI. So let's have a look on the MRI finding of this uh, gentleman. And found that MRI, there's a big tumor over the left postrolectal wall. There's around four centimeters, and also there's mossy growth around the big tumor. However, there's no bridge of the muscle wall. So in this score, it's just only very three, which is just only equivocal of the muscle invasion. And also the MRI showed that smaller tumor over the right lateral wall. Here's the picture in picture showing there's a comparison between the MRI and also the endoscopy view. and show that very accurate, even there's small growth it can also be detected over the MRI view. And also the various three show that there's an equal code of the muscle invasion. So in this situation, we will particular uh, have more muscle for pathologists to further staging of the breast cancer since they're a very big tumor. For the smaller one, it's also very free. It's also is equal vocal. So in this situation, we also take more muscle so as to rule any muscle invasiveness of the breast cancer. So here's the video showing there's a very big tumor just next to the left side uterine orifice. At the same time, there's mossy growth just next to the big tumor. At the same time, we can see there's a smaller tumor over the right lateral wall. Since uh, this is uh, very close to the obturator nerve, so uh, the BDSD is a uh, very good advantages. So as, the, as a cushion to separate the bad tumor and also from the bad wall. The first step is that uh, we have uh, five to 10 millimeter clear margin from the bread tumor. We mark up with the diaphragmy using the cutting mold. So conventionally, you can see. And afterwards, you can inject the mifflin blue. The advantages of the mifflin blue is that we can sting up the better base so that the pathologists know where is the better base and can particular focus to find out the muscle for proper staging. So I think the trick of this uh, BTS state is that you need to keep elevating the better cancer before you use the diaphragmy because it can help us as a cushion and also separate the bread tumor from bed wall so as to minimize the chance of obturator drug and also bread perforation. Now you can see that once you inject the different pool and also the saline, the tumor is elevated at least uh, around one centimeters from the bed wall. And then you can use uh, the tip of the receptacle so to have kind of blunt dissection. Here, I will particular uh, demonstrate this is the muscle. In this situation, we can inject the mifflin blue and also say to elevate the, this muscle. We particularly take this muscle for proper staging because we can very guarantee that we have included the whole muscle and send it for pathologists. So another beauty of this PDSD is the diaphragm can also to cauterize the lung rupture beta vessels and very efficiently so we can maintain a very clear wheel. At the same time, you can see that the cauterization of the beta base not that much. At the same time, after the removal, then we have hemostasis and similar procedure over the right lateral wall. After that, oh, after removing the two uh, tumors, Usually we use a very specific end of back to retrieve the tumor on block. And then we stick to the foam and with the, some pin so that we just kind of reconstruct the bread tumor and send it for pathology for staging. So the whole procedure is around one hour. There's no drop of hemoglobin. Usually for a big tumor, we have uh, better irrigation for six hours or overnight. And then usually the patient can be uh, off the Foley and discharge on post-op day one. And public, final pathology of the big tumor is a T1 highway. There's muscle included, but there's no muscle in, uh, invasion, just compatible with the uh, MRI before the operation. At the same time, the one centimeter tumor is a T8 high grade, and there's no uh, indemnity appropriate invasion. So we also uh, publish our earlier uh, outcome of the application of the rivers in the BTSD. Uh, we include the tumor uh, that was recruited in the BTSD and also with uh, rivers before our operation. There's also include a single or two tumor or even three tumors per case. And tumor size uh, range up to four centimeters. 
And the tumor distribution is all over the bladder, including the dome and anterior, and also lateral wall, which is a very high risk bladder tumor, the very high risk of uh, bladder perforation and also obturator jerk. The mid operation time is around 35 minutes. Uh, SMA blood loss is uh, just only around 10 mil. There's no bladder perforation or obturator jerk. Use of most of the case can be removed uh, the fully and also with discharge of our post up day one. And the pathology includes uh, T1, TA, TCC, even there's a normal pathology and can also be demonstrated as an inverted papilloma. So after you have gaining the uh, experience of BDSD, you can try some more challenging case in this situation. There's a gentleman, a smoker, there's also have two centimeter tumor, but this time there's unlikely that they cover the urethral orifice. So the, the video demonstrating how we use the BTST to uh, kind of dissection on block with the big tumor, just covering the urethral orifice. Step is the same, but this time I use the T-type one. Uh, honestly, both are very efficient, but for the T-type one, is uh, there's kind of bigger instrument. Sometimes you can help us to uh, better uh, efficiently to remove the on block uh, tumor. Now you can see you can uh, kind of uh, adhere the mucosa and then uh, kind of cut open the mucosa very efficiently. So I think the most important thing is that uh, we need to uh, dissect the intramural part of the distal ureter because the tumor also uh, covering the ureter so as to complete resection. So we need to have removed the intramural part of the ureter at the same time. But we just only use the same principle. We inject the mifflin blue and the cyanide underneath, and then we use the diabetes to cut open. And then eventually we can cut the whole distal part of the ureter, which is just only intramural part without perforation of the blood cancer. I think this uh, equipment is, uh, you can see that there's not much cauterization. Unlike a uh, PT, sometimes you have a lot of cauterization effect and also after the uh, resection, you can't find the new UO. Sometimes you cannot put in the JJ because the cauterization effect, you cannot find out the uh, JJ, uh, find out the user office to put in JJ. But in this situation that you can see that the tumor base is very um, clear. You don't have a lot of uh, diaphragm effect. So after removing the whole tumor, you can even see the uh, pulsosis of the distal ureter, which is one of the beauty of this uh, BTSD. Now you can see that uh, even though after the procedure, we can even identify the mucosa of the new ureter orifice. You can even see that there's some uh, movement of the distal ureter, just shown in this uh, video. Because uh, we is, uh, there's uh, not much cauterization effect, uh, after uh, make sure that there's clear margin and also include the muscle, we can insert the guide wire through the uh, new ureter orifice. And afterwards, uh, after confirm the position of the guide wire, we can start to put in the JJ. Uh, we have uh, found that uh, in this situation, uh, later on we have uh, surveillance cystoscopy, there's uh, no uh, obstruction and you still can some of uh, ejection of the urine from the new ureter orifice. So after that, uh, apart from the endo bag, for a smaller tumor, we can use the forceps to remove it. So another challenge case is uh, also a, a poor gentleman, a smoker, uh, and also have a history of bad neck obstruction, and there's a diverticulum, and luckily, you know that the diaticulum is also the risk of uh, subsequent uh, malignancy, including CCC. So in this situation, the starts we show that's uh, 1.5 centimeters, the tumor. We use the uh, little band imaging so as to have uh, better clearance of the blood tumor. And this situation, although the tumor is not that big, only 1.5 centimeters, but the problem is that the diaticulum is very thin. There's no muscle layer. At the same time, the space is very narrow, and um, yet we need to have a clay margin. So we try our best to have a clay margin first. In this situation, we particularly elevated the tumor more 
so as to away from the diverticulum wall uh, to avoid a perforation during the dissection. Now you can see that the whole tumor was elevated. At the same time, uh, we can cut open the mucosa effectively. We try our best to include some of the uh, leg of the uh, diverticulum so that uh, make sure there's a clean margin. And sometimes uh, you will find some difficulty in diverticulum because uh, the layer is uh, a little bit thinner as compared with a normal uh, better wall. So in this situation, I would suggest you to have a more meticulous one and to have a more injection of the uh, moving blue and also the saline so as not to damage the thin better diverticulum wall. Now you can see that uh, the whole tumor is gradually detached from di diverticulum without much uh, uh, bleeding here. So after that, uh, we change back to the white light. Uh, the white light uh, here, you can see that the tumor is uh, completely resected on block. At the same time, there's no perforation of the diverticulum. So apart from the BTSD, uh, I also use a special loop for the uh, onboard resection. This is a dynamic loop. Uh, it's a particular tailor made for the uh, onboard resection of black cancer. Uh, apart from the uh, semicircle uh, diaphragm loop, there's a square loop here. The square loop here, the advantages of square loop is that there's uh, very dynamic. You can use the angle of the loop, so as kind of uh, marking the clear margin from tumor, just like in this video. Afterwards, you can have uh, using the very long flat diving loop to start with the onboard resection. Um, the beauty of this is that uh, the flat surface is just the same or similar to the contour of the better wall, so that uh, there's more efficient as the other onboard resection using our type of the loop. At the same time, uh, conventionally, we will use the tip of the resectoscope to kind of run dissection, but we use this kind of square loop using the flat loop, then we can replace the tip of the resectoscope. At the same time, we can effectively to cut all the mucosa using the angle of this square loop eff efficiently. Now you can see that even there's fibrotic tissue, we can use the flat part of the loop to continue with cutting. At the same time, we can continue with the front dissection. Most of us, we find that the mucosa is very uh, tough and very sometimes it's fibrotic, but with this uh, square loop type, we can uh, easily cut open all the mucosa before continuing the uh, front dissection to finish all the onboard resection. At the same time, uh, you can see that the uh, uh, action is very pinpointed. So uh, even though in this situation is a postural wall tumor, uh, there's no jerk and also there's no perforation. Even the last bit of the bad cancer, sometimes you will find it very difficult because the bad tumor is flying, uh, just only attached a little bit, but uh, using this uh, very fine flat loop, you can e e very effectively to cut the last bit of the mucosa and then completely remove uh, this bad tumor on block. At the same time, you can see that the diving effect is very good. There's not much bleeding. So uh, afterwards, I also show the maneuver, how we include the muscle, because uh, sometimes you were very suspicious uh, that you didn't include the muscle for pathologists. I usually just uh, send a separate muscle layer pathologist. Now you can see that I can use the angle of this square loop to cut open a strip of the fake muscle and then send it to the pathologist. Because it is very dynamic, not only we use the uh, flat part of the loop, we can also use the angle. We can uh, hang up the layer of the muscle and then cut open it and then eventually then we can cut a very strong and thick strip of muscle so nowadays uh, we can uh, have uh, very uh, confidence that uh, we have include enough thick muscle for the pathology to have uh, proper staging, particularly if there's uh, where is, uh, three or more cases, we particularly to uh, have a meticulous uh, dissection of muscle layer for proper pathologies. 
So after showing the, uh, the video of PDSD and also the square loop, uh, may I have uh, opportunity to conclude my presentation by saying that the virus can guide us the invasiveness of the bad tumor before the PDSD or other unblocked section without radiation. At the same time, the BDSD is a safe and effective alternative of the transuteral unblocked section of the lung muscle invasive blood cancer and the square loop and uh, loop is facilitating an efficient on resection of the TRPT. Here's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lowe. That was a very interesting and very nice presentation of uh, hybrid dissection technique. Uh, you, and you demonstrated uh, in the last part, uh, even the very exclusive sampling of the detrusor muscle just to convince yourself in the pathology. So that was very, very uh, impressive. Thank you very much. Um, it, gives me, it gives me great pleasure now to invite the next speaker, uh, Dr. Theodoras uh, Tokas from hospital, uh, General Hospital Hall in Tyrol, uh, Austria. He's an established endourologist, uh, lab and a whole lab surgeon. So uh, Dr. Theo, uh, could you please Tell us about your experience with whole lab uh, in on block resection. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, from my side, uh, thank you for the invitation. It is. It looks like it is a great eye through um, uh, webinar again. So I don't know if you could see my screen. Yes, we can see your slides. That's great. Thank okay. you. Okay. So let's move on. So I have nothing to disclose and uh, my uh, presentation will uh, begin in the same direction with the previous uh, speakers. So we have uh, three goals when we uh, confront a tumor in any case. So we have to, uh, first of all, we have to touch the tumor uh, as less as possible. So if possible, do not touch the tumors. Uh, if possible, again, you have to remove the tumor in one piece and uh, at the end, uh, you have to be sure that uh, you control uh, the vasculature of the tumor as early as possible. So if we take the case of a TUR bladder with a relatively uh, big tumor, this is not a possible scenario as we can understand. So uh, we need to do better uh, than this and how. Uh, can we do better? So this is why, where end block resections came up. So there are a f uh, four concepts that we have to follow. So we have to improve the resection quality and uh, exactness of our staging. We have to reduce the perioperative complication rates. We have to decrease our recurrences and we have of course to decrease the, our redo procedures. So when we, when we speak about a new uh, type of procedure, we have as surgeons some expectations, of course, and those are the oncologic expectations, the improvement of staging and grading, the reduction of spilling and seeding, avoiding uh, to do uh, many cases in one patient, and the new procedure has to offer a short learning curve, and the pathology specimens have to be optimal and at the end of the day uh, the new uh, procedure the new technique has to be also cheap so uh, as far as the end block resection is concerned uh, the, uh, it has uh, an established place in the eu guidelines of course and a strong recommendation and uh, the history, how everything started, uh, is it was with a J-electrode and it was, of course, a monopolar energy. And after that, at the uh, end of the uh, 90s and the beginning of 2000, there were two studies uh, describing the laser, uh, the holmium laser and block resection and its feasibilities. So the uh, holmium laser was the first laser that was introduced in this field. And of course, there are some characteristics of this laser, uh, some important things that we have to talk about. First of all, the uh, radiation uh, has a strong absorption by water molecules at around 2,100 nanometers. It is uh, the holmium laser, it is a pulsed laser. So it is delivered in a uh, pulsed fashion. 
uh, it has a thermal vaporization uh, in the irrigant next to the fiber tip, uh, creating a steam bubble uh, with its laser pulse, and it is uh, highly absorbed. Um, the power is highly absorbed in irrigation and as well as the tissues. And uh, the tissue penetration does not exceed uh, 0.5 millimeters in water and also in tissues. And the laser vaporizes, cuts, coagulates tissues and fragments, stones of any composition. Uh, that makes it extremely useful in stone and BPH surgery, of course. So it is an established co uh, concept in these uh, fields. But what about the bladder tumors? What we have to say about the bladder tumors? Before we start uh, describing uh, some uh, cases of bladder tumors, we have to accept some facts from a BPH surgery. Uh, so first of all, it was uh, used by urologists in the early 90s uh, uh, as a HOLEP, as we know a term that we know it also today. Uh, the steam bubbles are used to separate the tissue layers by tearing them apart. And uh, the penetration uh, depth is uh, relatively shallow uh, with no significant coagulation necrosis, no dysuria and no urinary retention. This is a great advantage of the laser. So it also offers focused control of treatment with minimal collateral effects. And uh, we have, uh, after we finish, we have a, this bleached fibrous appearance, appearance of the treated soft tissues. And, uh, and uh, of course, we have an excellent hemostasis. What are the settings of this laser? What uh, do usually uh, surgeons prefer when they are about to use this laser? Uh, what uh, are the published data about it? So the resectoscope sizes range from 24 to 27 friends. The irrigant solution is a normal saline and the end firing fiber has a size of 550. And there is a relatively great variation in energy settings, but to be brief, uh, the energy ranges uh, from uh, 0 0.8 to a ma maximum energy of 2.2. The frequency uh, ranges from 10 to uh, 20. But of course, there is one uh, published uh, paper uh, on 2016 that describes uh, frequency reaching 50 Hertz. But um, to, uh, the most important parameter is the power. Uh, the power usually does not exceed the 40 watts. So this is what we would call in the uh, BPH surgery a uh, low power uh, setting. The resection margin also varies from two millimeters to one centimeter. And the total energy per case uh, ranges from uh, 13 to 34 kilojoules. The principle is more or less uh, similar with the uh, other uh, energy sources. So we have to um, uh, circularly mark uh, the uh, edges of the tumor. And then we st also start circularly to dissect. And at the same time, we also use a blunt dissection. So uh, after we finish, of course, we deal with the coagulation, which is not a problem in most of the cases. This was a very uh, interesting concept at the beginning of 2000, and there were six publications regarding the holmium yak lasers, two retrospective studies, and four prospective studies. But uh, uh, in total, there was a level of evidence uh, now three. As we move on, uh, looking at the literature, we uh, reached uh, to 2011, and this, there was a great uh, review by Kramer and Hermann. Those two names, uh, you are going to hear them the whole time when it's about uh, end block resection. So in this review, what we see is uh, there were 11 studies uh, regarding holmium laser and seven studies regarding thulium laser. What is the thulium laser? It is a topic of the next speaker. So I will not speak about it, but at 
the end of 2010, we st start seeing studies uh, describing this laser. From this graph, we see that those two lasers have similar uh, settings, especially when it's uh, dealing with wavelength. But what happens when we move on to 2017? So there is this great uh, paper by the same group. And in this, uh, in this review, what we see is uh, only three studies uh, regarding holmium laser. So in compared with uh, the first review, so there is a decrease of holmium studies. And on the other hand, when we look at the thulium studies, there is a constant increase. So especially uh, beginning from 2013, we see that more studies have to do with thulium and not with holmium. And uh, this is of course a trend towards a thulium laser. Why is that? We have to, we will answer it hopefully at the end of this webinar. And uh, as we reach uh, in 2020, so the last three years, uh, it is sad but true that there are not, no studies regarding holmium. So you see mono, even monopolar, bipolar three studies, hybrid one study and so on, but no holmium paper. And uh, if we look closely to this great paper, which is, in my opinion, is the highlight of this webinar, and I strongly recommend everybody to read it. So this, uh, this reviews uh, a great, uh, great evidence, so uh, randomized control studies regarding this topic, topic. And what we see here is no holmium studies. So there, there is not enough data even after those years uh, regarding holmium. On the other hand, if we take uh, prostate surgery and nucleation, uh, there it is an explosion of papers and randomized control trials uh, regarding holmium. Does this mean that we come to an end of the holmium laser? Let's find out. In the meantime, there are some multi-center studies uh, from the ESUT that indeed describe the holmium laser uh, among other energy sources and uh, they publish uh, good results. So some smaller studies uh, also uh, prove that uh, by comparing the holmium with the conventional uh, TUR, we have lower irri bladder irritation rates after mitomycin installation and we have a lower duration of, of bladder irrigation, catheterization, hospitalization, and so on. There is also a meta-analysis uh, showing that uh, by comparing holmium with TUR bladder, we have equal procedure times, less catheterization times, less hospitalization times, uh, better recurrence rates, no obturator nerve reflex, lower perforation rates, and lower bladder irritation. Also, the pathology specimens uh, look, uh, look good. So there is a detrusor muscle included in more than 95% uh, of the cases. And there is a high quality of specimens for the pathological evaluation. So that means that holmiums works after all, doesn't it? And of course, we can use holmium uh, together with all uh, new uh, modalities like NBI or uh, Hexfix with no problems. Then why do we have to move to the thulium laser? Again, the next speaker, uh, I am very eager to see his presentation about it. I will not uh, speak much, just remember some words when it's about the thulium laser, continuous versus pulsed, decreased penetration depth, smooth incision and vaporization of tissue, constant tissue interaction and superficial penetration. This is what I found when I looked in the internet about it. And if you look in this uh, review by Kramer and Hermann, you will see the disadvantages of the holmium laser, which are its pulsed emission mode. So this looks like the major uh, disadvantage when it's about uh, dealing uh, with uh, precision, dealing with uh, tumors. And also 
the disruption of tissue at the incision line, which has an effect, of course, sometimes maybe in the pathology specimens. On the other hand, the thulium has only high acquisition costs at the time and no other drawbacks. So, if we, uh, if we take together uh, everything that we discussed until now, it looks like the, thul the Holmium laser, sorry, it's, uh, it's a great laser for vaporizing tumors, but it's a not so uh, precise laser for uh, ERBT. So, uh, this is, looks like a, a great drawback of it. And um, when we, uh, this comes, to a more uh, complicated case when we have to do with a difficult tumor. So that means a big tumor or a tumor that is lo localized uh, near the bladder neck or uh, the bladder dome or near the orifices. And even in cases of multiple tumors, we have to be precise and uh, uh, I don't know if the Holmium laser offers the precision. Of mm -hmm. course, here uh, at this point, I, I have to emphasize the importance of surgeon experience. And uh, mm -hmm. at the end, uh, we, we uh, have to, to uh, deal with uh, surgeon experience and to see if this plays an important role when it's about to choose the treatment of the patient. Uh, I hope that the next speakers are going to complete uh, my talk because uh, the, thulium, uh, the Thulium talk especially uh, will give uh, much data about it. So thank you very much. Here I come to the end of my talk. Thank you, Theo. That was an excellent talk as always. I think a very balanced talk talking about both the benefits and potential limitations of Holmium enucleation technique. And you've also uh, laid the space for Chandra Mohan to start speaking on thulium enucleation techniques. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Chandra Mohan, who is a consultant urologist with the Preeti Hospital and uh, Kidney Hospital in India. And uh, he will potentially tell us all the advantages of thulium uh, enucleation uh, techniques in bladder tumors. Uh, Dr. Chandra Mohan. Thank you, Bhavan. Uh, hi, everyone. I first of all thank ITRU, a team for conducting such nice webinars. Thank you, Louis, and thank you, Bhavan. Special thanks to my friend uh, Vinit Gohar, who is very active academically and conducting such webinars regularly. Now I will share my screen. My talk today is, as uh, Theodore Tokas told, uh, the thulium is the one which is gaining momentum now. So now I will start with the thulium laser end block resection of bladder tumor. The conventional TORBT gold standard end block resection, as all of you told that it is uh, uh, the already in the guidelines have included homium YAG laser and uh, Thulium YAG laser are already used for two decades. Now it is Thulium fiber laser. To be honest, when the topic was given to me, I am using Thulium fiber laser for last two years in RIRS as well as in prostate and bladder tumor. So with that uh, experience, today I'm talking. The any aim of the TORBT is like all of you mentioned, resection of all macroscopic lesion, establish pathological stage and grade, identify significant prognostic factors. There are various types of laser. Directly, I will go to the laser. This slide is already uh, put by the TOCOS. There is no need to mention again. So thulium has thulium YAG, thulium fiber. One should not confuse with these two. Thulium YAG is the old laser. YAG is the medium. 2013 nanometers is the uh, frequency and it is a continuous wave laser. In stone, you need pulse. In soft tissues, you need continuous. It has two missions, 70 watts and 120 watts. The depth of penetration is 0.25. You said 0.4 for the uh, homium 
0.25 for thulium YAG and 0.15 for thulium fiber laser. This is a good review article by B. Wang with which I have put these points. Now energy settings in thulium YAG laser are 1.5 joules and 20 hertz on together 30 watts. Again, a good paper in the, uh, lasers in medical science by K.B. Lee has detailed all the thulium YAG laser in detail. It is the setting they recommended. The advantage is shallowness of the depth, continuous wave, as already mentioned. The other advantages uh, are clean cuts are achieved in uh, YAG laser. Definitely all these studies have proven that ERBT has less hospitalization time, less operative time, no operator jerk. Operator jerk not at all will be there in laser enucleations. These are the clear cut advantages. And muzzle is included in majority of the cases, 97%. And this is a, a short term studies only in 18 months, no difference in the recurrence. Clear and complete tumor bases were easily conserved by laser resection. We, we could see Carl Unlo doing with a laser like thing, but electrode injecting methylene blue and different type of electrodes. Caesar aim is not to have any artifact. First of all, to have the muzzle. After having the muzzle, not to have the artifact so that clear comment can be given on the biopsy specimen so that relook to your BT can either be avoided or reduced. The, so this is again same paper, Asian uh, Journal of Urology 2016. They say that uh, histology reporting is most straightforward with YAG laser. Video because I do not use thulium YAG. These are the uretric orifice. Uh, he is Dr. Wamsi from Hyderabad who is using thulium laser, YAG laser for quite some time. And uh, it is, uh, see when he is rejecting, what the argument a lot of people say in a large tumor, you cut off all the flower and send for biopsy, you know that it is superficial, it only gives the grade and pattern. Whereas the deep tissue can be separately taken with laser fiber, so that that piece only can come out directly through the act resectoscope sheath. Whereas you can use marcellator for the flower. That's what he is showing here. I have not done thulium YAG laser. With this slide, I like to move to my uh, laser with my experience. See, he is taking deep biopsy at the ureteric orifice. You need precision. What I'm feeling is because of the thulium fiber, has wide variety of frequency and energy settings, which I show in my cases, has clear precision in cutting. Thank you, Wamsi, for giving this uh, video. Now, thulium fiber laser, during this webinar season and COVID season, everybody might have seen this slide. No need to mention, it is not the thulium laser, it is the diode laser, it is a 10 to 20 micron core diameter, which is lined by the thulium ions doped and ultimately the important advantage is the tip which is very small. There is no need for blast sheet. There is no need for high energy current. There is no need for the cooling fan. Mission is sturdy. No conflicts of interest. It's the mechanism I am telling because I have to talk pro uh, ERBT thulium fiber laser which is latest one. This is the machine in India we are using. This is a, a continuous type of laser. You see, many times we see this in homium, uh, it, it, it's, it's pulse style, whereas in thulium, it is not pulse style, it is quasi, quasi pulse style or quasi continuous. The, the length of the uh, wave itself is quite long wave like this. That's why it is used in stone also. As a matter of fact, it is like thulium YAG, but electrically modified to make it pulsatile used for stone. Oh, it is very useful for the stone. It has wide ranges like pulse energy, frequency, pulse duration. 
one important point so far i have not noted in the literature is short pulse width if you want to cut precisely in bladder tumor short short pulse width is very useful we are trying in our initial experience it has given good incision these are the theory slide where it shows point uh, 0.25 to 6 joules and uh, uh, the frequency is up to 2000 hertz this variability needs some more time because only 10 papers are there now that to initial paper is in russia which is published and uh, even though research is done way back in 2005 if the laser fiber is small for example i had a case of stricture i will show that with nephroscope of 12 french also you can do the same movement it's like pencil now thulium fiber laser 1940 we have to remember it absorbs water the maximum among all the lasers thermal effect is the only effect which causes either incision or vaporization or coagulation undoubtedly it is the best coagulating laser but with varied setting thulium fiber laser is a better incising layer laser also now this is the wavelength form and uh, the early literature when i was going through it is very interesting that uh, nathaniel fried has gone too much depth he has given the nature of the uh, the thulium fiber laser in so detail in 2005 itself uh, they have done lot of research on the canine prostate i am very impressed with this paper and before that to be honest always we see the research at the lab level laser surgical medicine this peers and sharif have done lot of work on this uh, thulium silica fiber so this is a, a precise cutting if you see here 0 mm uh, no chance 0.3 mm 37% in homium yag laser whereas at 1 mm that means as you go deep it does not have any effect even you can perforate we have voluntarily perforated made a chunk of tissue and taken out with pre peritoneal or fat layer because it will not go further deep and does not damage the uh, intestine or whatever the viscera outside the bladder it is a old films in 2005 how they have done research we should remember this this is the way how the thermal coagulation this is the way at each micro uh, meter length it will be like this and this is very good picture where in the ureter and bladder neck they have given this is a specimen taken after the incision in canine model how depth it goes now other lasers uh, i already told it is repetens penetration depth is 0.15 this is the only thing we have to remember this is the smallest this is a paper which is still not published in 2000 this is 2020 eniki he has done lot of research and a very good uh, uh, phase 2 trial he has given some conclusions that thermal damage to the sample is less marked and it is a quasi continuous mode of firing and the same paper shows clearly that operator nerve uh, reflex is zero and perforation is zero i mean unless you made it purposefully and uh, bleeding is uh, in few cases catheterization time is less most more of the the other things are like papers presented in aua which says that uh, detrusol brazil is present in significant number of the patients and this is again same bladder cancer paper they recommend 1 joule 10 hertz that is 10 watts very less we are using 1.5 joules and 35 hertz that i will show in the video and uh, this is again video urology nice video you can see in the internet how they have vaporized they have done uh, 1 joule 15 hertz vaporization if you really want to vaporize small tumor which you have already know the disease if at all on follow up patients nicely you can vaporize very good video and uh, uh, ultimately this is also a recent urology U european urology supplement which shows that uh, n block rejection thulium group established on research they have done and it is safe they are saying with this literature i will show my 3 to 4 videos and then conclude i think i am sticking on to my time maybe another 5 to 6 minutes i will finish my talk this is operative step always stay 1 cm away from the tumor if it is not close to the ureteric orifice these are our settings incision is 1 to 1.5 joules 10 to 40 hertz short pulse width mesion cannot change the pulse width it only says short or long because it is quite big variation unlike homium 
now circumferential incision if you can give it's better because sometimes we get carried away and we go beyond the tumor unnecessarily remove the mucosa 10 mm is sufficient incision first you have to give and then you have to develop a plane see we have seen mechanically caesar is used you can't bend whatever but tip of the laser fiber can can go except the anterior wall or the dome for that also paper is there uh, chinese paper two papers are there they said that that also can be done because you can perforate and make almost a bladder wall taken along with this specimen when you are i have seen all the videos to be honest the muscle fiber can be so nicely seen if you set proper settings if you are getting black brown tissue you are not doing well for that bladder distension is essential normally bladder distension is not done in electrical uh, turbt where we may uh, uh, feel that bladder can perforate easily if you have a folded bladder it is easy to reject but you get charring at the uh, base you will not see clearly the muscle so in full bladder it is easy uh, usually at the end of it you have to apply a little bit of traction so that it falls off and you can end it otherwise you cannot end it will go on parallel so more than 3 cm you take off the flower and then take this thing the flower will be taken by the marsilator whereas a small piece carefully take it and send for the pathologist that's what we want flower is not that important important but uh, not for the muscle so cold uh, cold loop we use for the rejectoscope usually it comes out because it's soft tissue it curls itself and comes out forceps can be used basket i have not tried it is only theory yesterday i was putting that's why i mentioned this again this paper says that difficult locations can also be dealt uh, this is again asian journal of urology 2016 by v wang at all uh, this is a good uh, paper now this is the way the picture should look like uh, with this uh, our experience is 10 cases 100% muscle present no obturator jerk one case muscle invasive papilloma two cases seven cases uh, superficial tumors ta t1 bleeding post op had in one case where i have gone deep average catheterization time is 2 days i feel time if it is a small tumor all the papers say that time taken in enucleation is less but i have little doubt still i am uh, i am at the early stage of my career because in turbt one chunk you can take it out it takes half minute but in enucleation it will definitely take 5 minutes at least with this i will show my three four videos this is the first video uh, in block rejection of the bladder tumor and uh, uh, this is 38 years old male patient 1.5 cm obviously it should be a superficial tumor on ultrasound and the ct if it's a deep tumor uh, not advisable uh, so this is a setting which you are using incision 1.5 33 as i mentioned hemostasis is also very good i am using uh, the hd camera spice here a good quality camera makes a lot of difference that's why i am mentioning otherwise no conflicts of interest now uh, this is a tight bladder neck so we this is the tumor above the ureteric orifice and this is the ureteric orifice now i will show the see incision the main problem is if you stay a second also it causes coagulation if patient coughs or if you cannot move it it causes coagulation if you continuously move like this it will be lifting like in enucleation after some time in the bladder play, muscle plane see i am i have little perforated here not complete perforation but still now i am going on the sides then only it will lift up from the mucosa then it is going on to the sides and definitely in all the cases you will see the muscle see slowly if you move continuously then this carbonization effect will not be there and it should be lesser than this after seeing the literature now i feel that i should go with one jowl see here little coagulated because i stayed a little time there that is a, a, a technique and uh, at the end uh, see i am i am using little bit of traction with my laser fiber and then it is uh, pushed see otherwise it won't detach you will be continuously will be raising the mucosa and at the end uh, definitely you will see this is the coagulation mode 0.025 joules see the versatility 0.025 nicely coagulating the edge like any electrocutter we advise around 3 to 4 mm coagulation two reasons any missed small foci 
like that. See at the end, uh, uh, I will show the muscle fiber uh, very clearly seen like this, the, uh, and it has come out through the sheath. Now you can see with ureteric uh, catheter whether any perforation or not. This is this is a picture. So papilloma so nicely muscle is seen uh, in all cuts. Now this is the report. Now second one is similar. Here to is the resection of the. Uh, uh, no, no, nothing uh, different, but I wanted to point out what is. See, I initially thought. See, this is in the initial phase of me. Whenever you stay, you get this uh, uh, coagulation effect. You should not get. Otherwise, it becomes uh, electrocautery. If you continuously keep on moving very fast, it incises very well uh, with low energy one joule. Now, see the very transparent. Uh, uh, in fact, you can you can just go outside the bladder also if you are not careful. See, this is the muscle fiber seen. Again, edge is uh, uh, on either side of the edge is taken like this. It's like pencil or pen. You have to write it on the bladder surface. And see, this time I am not perforating. Uh, you have to distension characteristic should be good, and you should not collapse the bladder. If you collapse the bladder this plane will not come and at the end i am using again this is the this is the surface this is the surface how it looks like obviously the uh, the muscle fibers are seen that is same now this is a case uh, 71 uh, year old male patient with history in clopidogrel large case uh, tulium fiber tumor and again same thing we have done nothing new so i will fast forward this See, this is a way that it looks like perforation, but clear detrusor fibers are. That's all. Now, this is the histopathological section. I was discussing with pathologists. This is a slide clearly shows the, the mitotic cells in the muscle. See, this is a clearly in the muscle. Now, two interesting cases are there. Uh, incidentally, detector while doing URSL, this patient underwent RIRS, developed ureteric stricture, upper ureteric stricture. So suddenly when we were using uh, the laser C, it was stented. Uh, in the post stented case, suddenly at the ureteric carifies, we saw that. Then we called the patient attendant inside and uh, uh, then we tried to be superficial. But what happens, uh, if you want muzzle, you have to go uh, like this. You have to distend the muzzle. In that case, the injury to the a uh, stented ureter is uh, very high. In this case, actually, we were going very close to the uh, stent surface, but we got away without the perforation. This tumor ultimately came as a, a low-grade potential tumor. So he was fortunate to be detected this, and then we rejected like this. As the experience is increasing, the black charring is decreasing. That's what we are observing. This is one case. Now, this is a picture where muzzle is nicely seen. And no infiltration. Now, multiple tumors. If you have multiple tumors, no problem. This is the loop which we picked initially. This is the initial stages where five, six tumors were there. I want to show how it looks at the end. Otherwise, resection is same. Whether you show five surgeries or ten surgeries, uh, this is a see, small tumor. You, are, you mark it and lift it. This happens only in distended bladder, but in collapsed bladder, it is difficult. Now, at the end, you see all the tumors. This is one tumor. This is the ureteric orifice. I am just checking orifice is intact or not with the laser fiber. This is one tumor large. This is one tumor at the trigone, one more tumor. So uh, one case we have done with nephroscope where stricture was there. Again, nothing in technique wise. This is a 12 French nephroscope. Again, at the ureteric orifice. Uh, nicely, you can do it. Uh, but only thing is that vision will not be that much. With this uh, last video, I will conclude my talk. See, uh, it's all your depth. If you want to perforate, you can perforate. If you want to go in, in between the layers, you can. This is a precision. So you have to be precise. If you go deep, you may perforate. So prostatic urethral groove, one case. Sorry, I forgot. Here is a case of. Interesting case. In RGU, one patient, young male has come. Uh, e, e, this is the uroflometry. This is a small radiolucent shadow. When you went inside, you see in such cases, how will you reject? If you use TURBT loop, you may injure the C exactly here, exactly here. This is the tumor. 
these cases are not common so initially i kept the i have examined the bladder i examined this a uh, hypermic bladder a little bit this is a loop if i have used the loop some amount of the damage see exactly distal to the verru so i changed my mind to uh, incision and uh, even though i have not gone deep it's very precise and good margin i got fortunately again it has come as papilloma so this is the uh, areas where this precision helps a lot even though it is not bladder tumor it is on the transitional cell uh, region so this intact came in the in the urethra only it was there just the coagulation see i am coagulating at the area no bleeding and same day patient could be discharged this is was there in the lumen of the urethra and it came out like this it came out like this small one this is at the end of the picture muscle was contracting no problem at all just uh, uh, just distal to the see i am going inside see this is the membrana surethra this is a membrana surethra and just like that it is there nothing this uh, this is the picture so advantages are good quality specimen presence of detrusor muscle less complications less hospital stay disadvantage in large tumors it may be difficult abnormal location like anterior wall and dope a cost issue every every one two years you are getting one new laser with new settings you can't buy all of them so tfl has theoretical advantage over thulium yag laser initial clinical experience is promising further large scale studies are required to confirm we have sent the paper we will see with this 10 cases we have sent thank you for giving opportunity thank you once again i drew uh, vineet uh, lee and uh, bhavan for giving this opportunity thank you very much thank you very much dr chandra there was a very very interesting presentation and very nice videos of uh, very unusual cases um for all the audience that have joined us today we have more than a thousand online now we have gotten some of your questions and we will address them shortly in the q and a session so now uh, without further ado it gives me great pleasure to bring on the uh, last speaker for the session this is dr philip figueredo from uh, brazil um he is from hospital pompey and he's going to show us his tips and uh, techniques for some of the more challenging cases for on block resection Uh Dr. Philip all the time is yours now thank you very much hello everyone so i would like to thank Dr. Vinet for the invitation it's a great pleasure to be here it's an honor to to join you in this wonderful webinar i would like to congratulate the other presenters about the high quality uh, presentations and i'm going to talk about challenging situations in in block resection of bladder tumor I I must say I was seeing Dr. Toka's presentation about homeo laser ERBT and most of my experience is with homeo laser. So he presented all the data and I will present technical aspects of homeo laser ERBT because I have dedicated a lot, a lot of time to develop this this technique and I believe my presentation will complement his his talk. So share my screen please tell me if it's you everybody seen it Can you see Peter do we can see it if you could just enlarge it Okay this perfect okay. okay so I have no disclosure with the industry I I I do only endurology right now but I don't have a bipolar generator in my hospital I only have monopolar with a, the valley lab and i do mostly holeps so i have bought my own homeo laser i have all my homeo laser my holep equipment my resectoscope my laser working element and this is all you need to perform in block resection your homeo your holep equipment and your holep skills but if you work in a public hospital you have some challenges because most of the time you don't have a dedicated erbt loop and sometimes especially at the bladder dome if you have a, a 30 to 45 degree loop it helps to perform the 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 circular incisions so i have developed my do it yourself erbt loop based in a 0 degree monopolar hysteroscopy loop if you just bend it to 30 to 45 degree you have a perfect erbt loop so you can start doing a block resection with your monopolar resectoscope 
The second challenge is when you have small urethras. You will know that bladder tumor is a recurrent disease and patients with small urethra, they have multiple TURBTs and with the 26 French sheet, you have a lot of urethral trauma. So this patient had three previous TURBTs and you have a, a frequently you see some scars. With home URBT, you can use smaller resectoscopes to perform the, the surgery. I'm doing my whole lips with 22 French sheets and even with 18 French sheets and you reduce the urethral trauma and the chance of strictures. The second challenge is in male patients with long urethras and tumor at the bladder dome, sometimes the standard resectoscope, you can't reach the tumor. And to perform ERBT, you must work in a, with a full, full bladder. If you are working with an empty bladder, you, don't, you can't do the endodissection properly. So this is a challenge situation for, for ERBT. And there are longer resectoscopes, like an extra long resectoscope, it's six centimeters longer, and you can easily reach the bladder dome. And I think this is a game changer for performing ERBTs in, in the bladder dome. The other problem is the obturator reflex in lateral wall tumors, in electrocautery TURBTs, you have the problem of the obturator kick. And this video was from Dr. Dimitri in Kiev from Moscow, and he has shown while performing an en block resection with a bipolar Collins electrode, he had this perforation because of the obturator kick. So it's always a risk with electrocautery. So one of the solutions is to perform laser en block resection. We have homium, tulium, YAG, and tulium fiber. But why homium? You, we all know it has a very low penetration depth. Uh, but which would be the best settings to perform? A whole lip setting with two joules or dusting settings? So first I'll show a video from a friend with two joules. It's a friend from Curitiba in Brazil. And he's using two joules and 40 hertz. And it's a very aggressive resection. I would say it's more like a, a partial cystectomy. And you see you create a big damage to the bladder wall. This is in, a, in the posterior wall, but if it's in the bladder dome, you may have a risk of intraperitoneal perforation. And it's a full thickness bladder resection. So the first impression is that homium is not good for in block resection. But you know, homium is a pulse of the laser and this vapor bubble uh, creates a mechanical effect. And this is energy dependent. If you increase the energy, you have a bigger bubble and a bigger dis displacement of, of fluid. So with 0 0.5 joule, you have 15 millimeter displacement. With two joules, it's, it's almost double. And the infiltration of the bladder submucosa depends on three different factors. The amount of energy, the bladder filling, the tension within the bladder wall and the angle between the fiber and the tissue. To reduce the infiltration, you have to reduce the energy, increase the bladder filling and reduce the angle between the fiber and the tissue. So let's see what happens with dusting setting. 0 0.5 joules with high pressure in the bladder and a fiber angle, a fiber tissue angle of less than 30 degrees. You see the, the tension in the full bladder splits the edges of the, the, the incision and the, the short angle, it also helps to avoid this infiltration. So it's a very, very precise tool. And you may explore these mechanical effects to infiltrate the bladder submucosa just like the hybrid knife, like Dr. Lokalun have shown. It's a very nice tool. And to increase this infiltration, you just have to increase the energy to around 0 0.5 to 0 0.7, decrease the bladder filling with lower irrigation pressure, or increase the angle between the fiber and the tissue. So let's see what happened with 40 centimeters of, of water 
in the, the bag. This is a lateral wall tumor. You, have, you would have risk of perforation with electric loop. And you see you have less hydrostatic tension in the, the bladder wall and you have much more infiltration of the submucosa. So it's very similar to the hybrid knife concept if you know how to explore the bubble in your favor. You see here, I'm, 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 I have the angle between the fiber and the tissue of more than 30 degrees. And this is also important because it increased the infiltration of, of the bladder submucosa. And now you use the teeth of, of the scope to create tension and push the tumor laterally. This is the same skill that you have to develop to perform whole it. You, you, you create a, a bascule with the tip of the sheet, you push the tumor, and then the laser finishes the nucleation. And you see there is no thermal artifact, less than tulium fiber, because it's a pulsed laser and the irrigation fluid uh, cools down the tissue between pulses. So the specimen, it's perfect. You have absolutely no burning with these settings. My pathologist is a very skilled pathologist and she was amazed when I started to send her these specimens because there is absolutely no thermal artifact. I will show later. So you can see clearly the muscular fibers and that you are including muscle and even more, you can, you can define how much muscle do you want in your specimen. Like you can have muscle in 100% of the base of the tumor, not only just a small amount of muscle. And this is important to be sure that you have left no tumor behind. So you see this nice specimen. And if you see the, 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 the deep margin, you don't see any thermal artifact. You can even see some vessels. So you have the margin intact. So what about a full bladder with 0 0.3 Joule in 50 Hertz? So dusting settings. This is the ideal case. You have a small tumor. You do the circumferential mark. It's important to, to, to be a little further from the tumor to avoid damaging the lateral margins, so three to five millimeters. Then you go deep until you see the muscular layer. And after reaching the muscular layer and going deep enough to include it in your specimen, you can go around and remove and enucleate the tumor. So if you use 0 0.3 Joule, it's a little bit slower than the, with 0 0.5, but you have maximum precision and you decrease the infiltration of the submucosa. And you can have muscle in 100% of the tumor base. I believe this is very important to avoid a second TURBT. And you preserve the bladder wall integrity. You see in, in the follow-up cystoscopies, you barely can find where was the tumor. You have less sharing if you can go uh, with precision. So my pathologist, uh, she now we have uh, uh, developed a program where she gives me how much of the tumor base is covered by muscle. I want 100% of the tumor base with muscle uh, we have this top-down orientation of the, the tumor, so it's very easy for her to, to tell me uh, if, uh, about PT1 substaging. She can see here that the tumor, it's a PT1, but above the muscularis mucosa, and this has prognostic implications. And we have minimal thermal artifacts, even in the lateral margins, using those settings. So for me, the ERBT trifecta is to have muscularis proper in 100% of the tumor base. You have negative lateral surgical margins and deep uh, negative surgical margin. And this could be the new quality standard for TURBT for the specimen. So we don't have to compare if we have muscle or not, but if we have muscle in 100% of the tumor base. 
But what about big tumors? Can we do it with home laser? So this is a very young patient with a five centimeter adenocarcinoma and CCT glandularis. It's, it's, it was all around the trigon. We couldn't find the ureteric orifice. So you just find the, the lateral margins of the tumor and you do a circumferential incision. I have to start at the black and neck level. So you go deep until you find the muscular layer. And you can see the, the muscular fibers as a healthy tissue. And you proceed moving forward in the, in the safe zone. And it, it's quite challenging. I would say that whole lip is difficult, but to master these skills, it's even, you have a learning curve. So I don't think this is something that everybody will be able to do. You have to do whole lip to be able to do something like this endodissection. But you see, you can find the intramural ureter. It was dilated, so I, I, I didn't even stent it after these incisions on both sides. The same on the right side. And you see, this is a very precision tool. You can't do that with the same precision with the loop. And you see that the bubble infiltrates the plane and you just do the endodissection. You, you see the vessels, you can stop to, to, to perform a better hemostasis, but the tumor was too big for extraction. So it's important to avoid releasing the tumor completely. So I had to, to cut it in two pieces with the loop to be able to, to remove it. I don't have endo bags available for, for removing these specimens in Brazil. So the best tool to specimen extraction for me is called the code curette. It's a stainless steel strong loop that don't, doesn't bend or break when you're removing tumor. And you can use with your standard resectoscope. You just have to, to cut the tumor uh, small enough, uh, enough to pass through the 26 French sheet. And then you, you remove together with the, the inner sheet. And then you finish your YRBT to remove the second, the second part of the tumor with the, the code correct. The patient go home next day. I ha I'm, you can have remove large pieces as long as you have uh, uh, each piece able to pass through the resectoscope. You can remove the distal ureter uh, in one piece with the, the tumor. So for me, the real voyage of discovery is not about seeking new landscape, but having new eyes. You can use your own tools, available tools, to perform a better surgery if you dedicate time enough to improve your technique. So thank you again for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. These are my contacts. I know many of you from Twitter. I have some videos on YouTube and you can check part of this presentation. It's on, on YouTube too. So thank you again. Felipe, that, thank you very much. That was a, that was a really nice talk, very entertaining. For some of your videos, I, I, I sometimes thought you were doing a whole lip rather than a TOBT because that's how good it was. So excellent work. Uh, we'll start the Q&A sections now. We've had a lot of questions and a real active interest in the webinar today. One of uh, <clears throat> the people who's been really actively interested in the webinar is an eminent uh, uh, TORBT surgeon, uh, Mr. Param Mariapan from the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. And some of you may be aware that he's recently defined some of the QPIs for conventional TORBT. He's had some questions on training. And the first question, if I could direct it to Jeremy Teo. Uh, Jeremy, in the recently published systematic review, do you have a feel for what uh, 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 operating experience uh, on block uh, surgeons had in compare in comparison with TRBT. And I think this is just leading on to the question 
uh, about what the learning experience with the enucleation techniques are. Jeremy? Okay, so uh, thank you for the question. Um, in, in the studies that we have included, all the RCTs, basically um, most of the studies in the methodology stated that so-called experienced surgeon uh, does the procedure. They didn't really specify how experienced one should be before doing envelope resection. Unfortunately, if you look into literature, basically there's none. There's none, no study at all addressing so-called the learning curve of envelope resection. Just based on personal experience, I think it's not a particularly difficult procedure to learn. Definitely easier than enucleation of the prostate gland. In my opinion, 10, 20 cases more than enough to really master the skill. But that's just my personal opinion. Jeremy, can I ask you a follow-up question and <clears throat> slightly related to the evidence that we have. Now, one of the theories is that because we're not uh, performing a piecemeal resection and we're abiding by oncological principles with uh, the nucleation technique, the, the, the purported advantages are that the recurrence rates and the progression survival or uh, progression rates will be lesser. But are we dealing with a group that has a degree of selection bias? Because, not because of the technique, because our extraction techniques are limited. We can't really deal with tumors that are above three centimeters. And perhaps we're dealing with solitary, less than three centimeter tumors whose uh, recurrence rates or recurrence potential is lesser than other groups. This is totally correct. That is why when you look into meta-analyses, especially when you include non-randomized study, it's very, very biased because you tend to be on blood resection or tumors or, or patients with fewer tumors. So that's why in our review, we only included randomized trial and I think it is for good reason. But having said that, I think the, the major benefit of on blood resection is really to ensure a complete resection locally. And this benefit is really for non-muscle invasive blood cancer. Given this in mind, actually, we're talking about, you know, early disease. So I'm not saying that three centimeter is not a limited, definitely a limitation, but most tumors, most non-muscle invasive blood tumors, um, I would say somewhere about 85 to 90% would be amenable to oblate resection. And just to share with you some of my experience, even for big tumors, when you think it is muscle invasive, it may not be the case because endoscopic judgment is just you know, prone to error. And so even for big tumors where you can't really take it out in one piece, but the, the, the way you excise it locally still, you know, is still something important because it may still come back to be T1 disease instead of a muscle invasive disease. So I would argue that for big tumors, there may be still you know, a benefit for so-called on block resection, but retrieving it in a multiple fragment manner. I agree. I think that's, that's very reasonable. Uh, Dr. Liu, would you like to ask uh, a question? Yeah. yeah, hi, thanks, Baba. So maybe I'll, I'll pose this question to the entire panel. Uh, this is a question from uh, Dr. Paramarapan again. Uh, do you think that there would be a need to perform a certain number of tr conventional transurethral resections before you embark on an on-block technique, uh, as you have described, whether that would be laser or an any other energy preference of your choice? Uh, or do you think that on-block resection might actually be the way forward for urologists in future? And that transurethral resection might be you know, outdated and thrown out of, of the door? So I open this question up to all the panel. Um, we look for uh, anyone can please please start the comments. Thank you. So let me let me talk about homeolasia RBT. I believe that uh, you have to have these skills with the resector. So if you are a trainee, you are during residency, you have to learn how to use the resectoscope. So TURP, it's a very nice tool to learn how to do to use the resectoscope. But once you, you, you know how to handle it, 
there is no difference in the learning curve for PCMU resection or for M block resection. To be honest, I don't think I, I know how to do a good TURBT in PCMU resection because I have perforation, I have bleeding with M block after I have started trying to do it. I was able to do all my surgery without perforation, even with the monopolar do-it-yourself loop. So despite the difference in the available tools, if you can find a zero degree stereoscopy loop and bend it to 30 to 45 degree, you can start to, to resect from the margins to the, to the center and do the end of dissection, work with a, a, a more a full bladder, and it's all about skills. You have to develop your skills in any kind of surgery. So I don't think we see many uh, ex TURBT surgeons with a little resistance about in block resection because they are very skilled. They have treated thousands of patients, but this is not my practice. These videos I have shown, I have less than 50 cases of ERBT. Most of my practice is stone, stone disease, a flexible retroscopy and holeps. So if I can do that with 50 cases, it's all about my experience with the resectoscope. So we have to improve our technique. We have to be better surgeons so we can improve the outcomes for the patients. It's not about necessarily uh, to do standard PCMU to RBT before ERBT because you can have a better staging only the staging aspect of ERBT is enough to put a PCMU resection in history. So it's all about resistance to change. You have to convince the most experienced ERBT surgeons that if you have better specimen, even before a Dr. Teo uh, randomized clinical trial that hopefully will, will put an end to this question. But even now, if you have better staging, and you have a better uh, local resection, you don't have to do a second TURBT. If you have deep margin uh, free, you have lateral margin free, you just have to do a cystoscopy to see if the patient has another tumor in other lo locations. So this is my, my opinion. I'd like to hear the opinion from the others. I just want to add one point is that um, if we look into the trial data, one thing that is quite surprising. It's about the risk of perforation. It's actually lower in the on block resection group. And when you think about this, it's because the surgery itself is much more elegant, much more precise. So to the question, do you need to, to perform a lot of conventional TRBT before you do on block resection? I think the answer is no, because on block resection, you see the, pla the planes much better. You know where to cut more, e more easily. So I think we can, you know, for a fresh surgeon, he might just start to learn omelette resection at the very beginning. The only, the only tumor which I think maybe we need to switch to piecemeal resection is those um, um, bladder doom tumors where your action might be really difficult. Um, if you do omelette resection, it's kind of end on. If you use laser, it's kind of end on as well. Sometimes it's difficult to, you know, go at the bottom then maybe, maybe piecemeal resection will be easier. But still, I think most of the time, it's still manageable, even if you do an on blood resection. I do agree with Teal. Uh, especially, we may use the hybrid knife. Uh, the fresh trainee can start with uh, hybrid knife instead of TLBT. At the same time, I do agree that TLBT will be just limited to a very big tumor. Let's say this occupy at least half of the better capacity is most likely is uh, muscle invasiveness. Then uh, you just need to have uh, resect down to the muscle layer to confirm this is muscle invasion before you go to the adjunct therapy, do adjunct therapy or any cystectomy. So I do agree with other speakers that uh, you can start with the upper resection instead of TRBT. So the question about uh, TRBT being outdated or obsolete, I think TRBT is going to stay as ERBT is going to stay, even TRBT also is going to stay. Because as you rightly said, when it comes to last tumors, we have to do in piecemeal. Instead of doing on block, struggling, trying to use a morselator and not having a specimen for histopathological examination, I would suggest do a proper 
uh, piecemeal resection and send the deep muscle layer separately instead of you know going for any other treatment you should always go for a trb for large tumors because retrieval will be a question which you have to think of when it comes to tumors which are more than 3 cm in a male in female sometimes you can some of pull it and get the specimen out but when it comes to males more than 3 cm is a little difficult to retrieve is it fair to say that rather than the argument of piecemeal resection one of the more retractive points of on block resection is that you're able to locally stage very accurate because you're able to get a deeper muscle and also pathological evaluation is safer there are areas within the bladder particularly the lateral aspects of the bladder which are perhaps not as much at risk of obturator jerk with an on block approach rather than uh, a conventional t of bt i i accept your argument of uh, piecemeal resections but my feeling is the reality is that to prove that hypothesis as much as it feels right you need bigger tumors with bigger risks of uh, recurrence and progression and because of the limitations of extractions it may be difficult for you to prove that hypothesis would that be reasonable my oh, sorry can i can i talk yeah yeah my sure. only concern i i want to ask philip uh, regarding this uh, it's okay if, if the both are different techniques you are bt not necessary to do n block i agree for that provided you know the rotatory movements of the working element but if it is a anterior wall tumor most of the times we collapse the bladder we press and we cut again we empty again we press clean the loop is it possible to do i don't have experience with the laser fiber whatever may be the laser any technique to take good margin both uh, uh, around the tumor and the depth of the tumor technically it looks different that time you need loop uh, what is the comment philip sir i agree with you i think that TURBT it's it's difficult because it's different surgeries depending on the tumor location as dr jeremy have mentioned at the bladder dome you have an end fire fiber uh, pointing to the bladder wall so you have a 90 degree you have more infiltration so it's very challenging to use only homeo laser so i usually combine my uh, monopolar 45 degree loop with the homeo laser i use the laser to infiltrate like hybrid knife then i change to the loop i use glycine and i do the endo dissection with the the 45 degree loop just like the the square loop so it's a cheap loop reusable and i i do a combined homeo laser plus monopolar uh, erbt so you can have the best of both tech tech technologies for anterior tumors some patients uh, you have a, a very steep angle and you can't reach below the tumor so it's very risky you have to push with your hands to to try to to reach it so sometimes in, in very large tumors i have treated some patient with tumor in a, a, almost 70% of the the bladder i have to do staged resections and it it was everything pta in very old and sick patients so they are still with their bladder but what you have to do you, you have to to find the plane at the the bladder neck so you go deep enough and when you have the tumor like like here you have this this flap you go under the submucosa and you use the resectoscope to like hole it you 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 push the tumor and you just follow the plane and you can remove the whole anterior wall in the submucosal end of dissection it's it's quite elegant surgery it's very challenging uh, i was very excited to do this at at the beginning of my development but it takes a lot of time <laughs> so it's it's not a fast surgery if you have tumor in the the whole bladder it may take one and a half hour doing this end of dissection so your next surgery will be late so i'm 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 very focused in my whole practice right now but it's it's 
it's it's very exciting to do that because you don't know if you will be able and you have to manage. I have already thought about different ways to do that. One of my theories, I couldn't try it. Maybe one of you could try it, was to puncture the red tube space, the prevesical space with a very very needle of laparoscopy and if you infiltrate this plane with CO2, so you can push the bladder wall down and you have a very straight line. So if any of you have a very tough anterior tumor and you are not able to, to push with your hand enough, try to use the various needle before the bladder to push with the bladder down with the, the, the gas. So maybe it can improve if you are able, please send me a message that my idea was perfect. I, I have I have a various needle that I have bought just for that. I'm not doing laparoscopy anymore. And I bought a various needle just to use it, but I didn't have the case to try it. So this is one possible way to fix the problem. And the bladder dome problem, you have to combine the home laser with the, the, the loop to push it. And, and you can increase the bladder thickness. One of the questions from the audience if you have a very thin bladder wall, uh, wouldn't risk perforation with a full bladder. If you manage the angle, the energy, and the, the bladder feeling, you can increase the thickness of the bladder if you the submucosa, and you can be very precise using less energy, like 0 0.3 joules. And then you have a very large space to do the endodissection with the monopolar loop. So it's, 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 it's tricky, but it's also challenging and you start to like it. And then you, you are just wondering, when is my next bladder tumor surgery? <laughs> Thank you. Nice. That, that's very nice, uh, Philip. Uh, uh, <laughs> just to deviate slightly, if that's okay, from no energy techniques, if I could go to Zishan. Zishan, you use minimal energy with the Z-scissors. Uh, have you had any patients who've come back with hematuria or clot retention? Oh, that, that's a nice question because before I could start this using the scissors, I used to always think bladder tumor is the most vascular tumor. But only after I started using, I realized there are only few uh, vessels which you have to coagulate. It's not that you're getting a lot of blood vessels below the tumor. So what I usually do is start excising. Whenever there is a small tumor or small bleeder, I start coagulating towards the bladder surface because we don't use the current on the specimen side so that there won't be any artifacts. So we try to use it only towards the bladder surface. Until date, I have not had any patient who has come back with any clot retention. So these are all small in-point bleeders which you have to just focus and coagulate. You don't need to charge the whole bladder surface with, with the source. This is what I realized after using the scissors. I just want to add one point. After seeing so many videos, I think we can appreciate that at the right level, when you reach the, the correct plane, you can really see the, the tumor vessel going from below. And it's really that vessel that you need to coagulate. So that's probably why Cishan is so successful. You coagulate that pinpoint vessel and then you have a very clear feel and uh, no bleeding afterwards. Right, right. Okay, Lou, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Yes, yeah, so maybe I would ask one question from Nepal in the, uh, in the chat group. Uh, this opens to all the panel too. Uh, what is your experience re-resecting using your technique in a scarred area, i.e. somewhere where it's been previously resected or whether it's piecemeal or unblocked? What, do you ex what is your experience in these areas? Are there any particular challenges? Okay, I'll just uh, give some comments. Definitely, um, with previous resection, definitely the scarring will have some um, effect because the natural plane between the that between the submucosa and the muscle is gone basically. So it's definitely more difficult to perform. Um, but having said that, um, there was a report uh, on so-called on-block re-resection, which was uh, published in World Journal of Urology. And it seems that it's still quite a safe and technically feasible um, surgery. But I would say, you know, preserve it, you know, when you have more experience, then you may try. But otherwise, 
probably you should be more careful. And uh, if you have any problems, just confer to Peace Barrier Section. Okay. Uh, if the next question is to Mr. Gujadir. Uh, okay. Rahul, uh, what proportion of your patients do you offer TULA? And do you give them mitomycin after the procedure? Oh, I think we, we, for ours is quite a large tertiary unit. So we form in excess of 800 TURTs, or in, including resections in a year. 10% of that would be suitable for TULA, or 80 to 80 in a year. But the uh, proportion that require mitomycin on those, we need to remember, basically those who are getting TULA are mostly recurrent tumors. They don't really require tumor, um, mitomycin. But a small proportion who are having TULA for a, for a primary tumor, which as they would never have a GA or not, not be fit for it, those, they, they are suitable for having mitomycin. And we, we have given that in the occasional case that we've had to do it. We require some more uh, organization. Uh, and then you leave a catheter after the plexi and they go to the specific ward where they have their uh, mitomycin and go. It requires some more uh, logistical organization to do that. Because I know that not many. Can I, on the, on the point of mitomycin, can I ask the panel? So we've seen the thulium uh, resection and the uh, holium resection. They're quite deep. So do they give mitomycin in their in their primary resection? Yeah, in all the cases, we give mitomycin in all the cases. Okay. Okay. Despite being the despite the resection being so deep, you have no no issue. Yeah, 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 despite yeah. the resection. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask one final concluding question to the panel? Uh, with enucleation techniques, uh, I think what we value as uh, uh, high quality sur uh, surgery are the surrogate markers of quality might change and tumor margins will become a quality index, which we haven't used in the past. So if that being the case in patients with negative margins, if you have high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, do you think there'll be less proportion of patients we will be offering re-resection for? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, definitely, definitely. Um, um, especially, you know, it, it creates a lot of questions, actually. I mean, um, um, not only how, whether the negative margin is genuinely correct, but also, you know, when there's no muscle, for example, but a clear margin. Do you still need second look surgery or early T2 disease, clear margin? We have seen such cases. Do you still need to go for a cystectomy? You know, a lot of these questions. But the problem is, you know, we don't have enough trial data basically to answer these questions. I think the first step is to make it more general, really. Uh, whether on blood resection, most important thing is whether it will reduce recurrence rate for normal and blood cancer. And if that's the case, then, then probably it should replace TRPT as a so-called standard. And then by, by then, hopefully we have more data to answer the questions that you raised, that you have raised, how to deal with different scenarios in which we haven't encountered before. Yes, I agree with Excellent. you. Yeah, I agree with you. And also I was a little bit supplement on that is uh, the investment of this VREX there is MRI before the umbral resection. Sometimes it can help us to kind of uh, planning. Even though there's a uh, new muscle included, there's T1 high grade. If the previous told us that there's a uh, three or more, then it will advocate the uh, uh, early TRLP second look. Uh, because of the recent study also showing that uh, uh, trial that uh, if there's a uh, high grade, high risk during the MRI before the operation, even though the proposed combat is uh, there's T1 high grade without any muscle invasion. Yes, advocate early start of uh, single look TRLBT. Fantastic. Vineet, uh, if I may just ask your permission before I conclude, I, I take it there are no further questions you want me to ask? Yes, uh, Bhavan, I would uh, definitely, I would just want to make a few concluding remarks before I pass it back to you. I think yeah. presentations were excellent. Uh, we've had almost 1,100 logins from worldwide. The, the talks have given us a lot of food for thought. 
They've definitely uh, given people reason to try and change the practice. I think with any technology, we know the, when you adapt technology, you need to learn it. When you learn it, you need to then improvise it. And when you improvise it, you sort of gain the experience to do something a little more uh, challenging. So our whole idea of the webinar today was precisely that. There's a feedback form that will come to all of you who have logged in um, in an email about 10 minutes after this. My sincere request on behalf of everybody is to please provide us the feedback. At ITRU, we take it seriously and we, we like to improvise. We like to give you high quality um, discussions. And uh, thank you. I uh, would pass you the uh, mic again, Bhavan, to please uh, end the webinar with a vote of thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vineet. Uh, I think it's clear that uh, there's a lot of innovation with on block techniques. Uh, just one word of caution, when we all innovate, we must involve our clinical governance teams and new intervention teams, because at the end of the day, this is about patient safety, and we must do it in the right uh, uh, environment. Uh, this is also a time for thank yous. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Vineet for organizing this uh, webinar. As always, it was excellent. I'd like to thank my co-moderator, Dr. Lou. Uh, thank, it was great teamwork as always. And all the speakers, great presentations. I think we've all learned a lot. And to our uh, viewers as well, thank you for logging in. Keep joining us and we'll have more interesting talks and webinars to come up with as well. Uh, on behalf of i team, uh, on behalf of Sun Pharma, both Hemant and Anand, thank you very much for your contributions. And until next time, to all our viewers and uh, to all our team members, thank you very much and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye to all. Take care.